Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Seek and Destroy, and happy Halloween still. Hopefully, I get this third video out there. I actually forgot about this temporarily. I, I had my notes and everything, so I have my cheat sheet underneath the camera, but this was something that was requested by a viewer of ours, uh, not just from this channel, but my gaming channel also. So shout out to Trusty Rusty. He's the person who reached out to me and said, hey, man, you talked about your Resident Evil screenplay that you wrote, your spec script called Domicile. Is there any chance you could share that and we can read it? And typically with spec scripts, I don't share the full scripts. I don't post them out there. Uh, if it's something like I write that's like an original thing, um, I might share those because it's usually like short stuff and everything. And plus, I'm still working on Neverland. So I, I, that's kind of my more of that writing priority and House of Ghosts, which I'm also trying to finish up for my friend Mark. Um, so I, I tend to not really share a bunch of stuff that I hope comes out one day, uh, you know, unless it's something like a short film that I'm like, OK, we might film this. So like, uh, is it yesterday yet was something I shared and posted the whole script on on social media. And it's like, yeah, it's fine because we're going to film it and we're going to make it. So um, so we're in complete control of that. Uh, but stuff like this is, um, you know, spec scripts are typically something where writers can kind of flex their writing muscles and kind of get, uh, you know, try to a different genre like I, I love horror movies, but I don't write a ton of horror. And House of Ghosts is like a comic book I'm working on that is kind of horror related. And when we were starting on that, that kind of scratched an itch in me. And so I said, you know what? I love Resident Evil. I would love to write a Resident Evil screenplay. I'll do it as a spec script. I'll call it, I'll give it a code name. So I call it Domicile. And uh, and then that's basically something I have to pitch around to show places like, hey, here's what I would do with an established property like Resident Evil. But also here's just an example of my writing in the genre of horror. And it actually ended up uh, through, you know, I let some people read it and, and it ended up uh, getting a job writing a TV show pilot. Unfortunately, it was never made because when we started it, it was at the beginning of COVID or it was before COVID. And then once we were like, okay, we're gonna get into production stuff, everything shut down or, or at least there was like no more communication after that because uh, yeah, it was, you know, COVID happened and, and it, this was something we were gonna shoot overseas in Asia. So it was just one of those things where it was like, OK, well, this project is probably dead now. But that's why you have spec scripts sometimes is to hopefully get you other jobs, too. Um, so that's what Domicile is. It is my version of Resident Evil. And I know a lot of people would be like, OK, so it's just an interpretation of Resident Evil 1, uh, the video game. And it is actually not. <laughs> it, it has things that are featured in Resident Evil 1, the video game, but it is about the Trevor family. Uh, so a little back history here before I get into what the story is. Resident Evil in the first video game, you play in a mansion, you're walking around as a special forces team trying to solve these mysterious murders. You end up in this mansion in the woods, and that mansion is owned by Oswell E. Spencer, who is the founder, one of the three founders of the Umbrella Corporation. And as you work your way into the mansion, there's puzzles you got to solve to unlock doors. It's like really weird. Like, why would anyone make a house like this, you know, other than to trap people in it? Um, well, I wanted to do a story about the origins of that house. How did that house get made? And there are files in the video games uh, that tell you some of that story. And they talk about a guy named George Trevor and how he designed the mansion. He was an architect and he designed things. And, uh, and he built this mansion essentially for Oswell E. Spencer. And once it was done, George Trevor and his family got invited to the mansion by Oswell E. Spencer to kind of see the completion of it. And turns out there's a story there where George Trevor was really lured in by Oswell E. Spencer to die. Because uh, Oswell E. Spencer didn't want anyone to know how to solve the puzzles, you know, what the true nature of the mansion was. It was protecting a laboratory with a bunch of, you know, awful experiments. He didn't want any of that information to get out there. So he had to tie up his loose ends. And George Trevor, unfortunately, and his family were a couple of those loose ends. And they not only kill George Trevor or cause him to die, um, but they also uh, drug his wife and his daughter, Lisa, and uh, both who mutate uh, differently. And so that is kind of the lore of the characters in the game. So I wanted to do something uh, where I made a movie about that to where you almost didn't know if you're reading the spec script, unless you know the names of the characters, like unless George Trevor makes you go, oh, that's Resident Evil George Trevor. When you're reading this script, you actually don't know it's Resident Evil till like a pretty good chunk into the script. I would say there's some breadcrumbs that kind of show you that it could be Resident Evil because uh, there's like umbrella logos that I had written in there like, hey, show an umbrella logo or something. Um, so there's stuff in there. But uh, for the most part, if you read like the first 10 pages, you have no idea it's Resident Evil. And then about around page 15, 20, you start piecing it together. And then I think by page 30, you pretty much get an idea because we start talking about Oswald E. Spencer. So again, if the names don't mean anything to you, 
you won't guess, uh, you know, right away. But if the names do mean something to you, um, you'll you'll guess instantly almost. <laughs> so uh, so that's kind of how I wanted to write it, and I wanted to build up to the creatures, and I wanted to recapture that feeling of Resident Evil One, the video game, where you are in the video game, you're a special forces member, you're trained, you know, to fight and be in combat, and yet you battle things that are just way above what you're ever prepared for. It's kind of like the movie Predator. You get all these special forces guys, they go in the forest, they think they're liberating people and freeing people and rescue, doing a rescue mission and, and mercenary. So they're killing some, you know, uh, you know, gangs and stuff that are like it, like living in the woods, tribes and everything that are like uh, causing trouble in this area. And, uh, and then the Predator shows up and it's just way out of all of their leagues. None of them are prepared for it. And that's kind of what Res Evil 1 is to me. It's, it's trained people going in and getting in way over their head. So Domicile, I'm like, well, I don't want to do the same thing. So, but I want to tell the story of George Trevor. So that's what this story is. It's, it starts off and it starts off in Africa and you have uh, the Nidipaya tribe. And uh, they are the ones who are guarding this very special flower called Stairway of the Sun. And you have this expedition guide named Brandon Bailey, who was mentioned in Resident Evil 5. You have James Marcus, you had Edward Ashford, um, who are kind of uh, funding the expedition. Well, Oswald e. Spencer and Ashford are funding it. James Marcus is kind of the scientist. And they all go into this section of Africa and they find this rare flower that can grow underground without sunlight. Uh, and so they, they pull a sample of it and they're like, this is about to change our lives. And then boom, you flash forward like 20 years and now we're at the mansion and George Trevor is arriving there uh, with his family to uh, see see it in its completion. And they're like, Dad, I can't, so you built this? And he's like, well, I didn't build it with my hands. You know, I designed it and stuff, and your mom helped. And so that was like a fun nod because I was like, you know, I really want to do something interesting with uh, Jessica, uh, George Trevor's wife. She's not mentioned too much in the books um, but uh, or in the, in, like, in the games and stuff. She's mentioned a few times, and I actually, at one point, I think you find her tombstone, uh, where Lisa Trevor, you know, uh, like, tries to, you know, grab her face or whatever. Like, there's a whole story. We'll get into it. Um, but I wanted to do a little bit more with Jessica. So I have this little line at the beginning where George Trevor says, yeah, that's, you know, um, your mom helped. And you're kind of like, oh, okay. So how did, how did she help, you know? So that's kind of the, one of the reveals in the story, is that uh, as they go into the mansion, they meet Patrick, who is Oswald e. Spencer's butler. Uh, I created a character named Felicia, who was a maid at the place. Um, and then I also have a doctor nearby, um, so who's like a guest at the, at the mansion. And he's like, you know, looking through the labs. He's kind of checking, going through all the checklists, him and James Marcus. And they're making sure the lab's up to code and everything. So it's kind of the beginning stages of stuff. But they're, they don't say why they're there, the two doctors, because obviously that would reveal the lab. So they're just like, oh, we're here on vacation, our holiday, and we wanted to see this grand, you know, place that you built for our friend Oswald e. Spencer. Uh, but really, Dr. Lawrence Darius is has a different motive. And if you know that name, you might know who he's connected to in the video games. And then Felicia is just like an innocent maid. There's a chef crew, there's a staff and everything. So there are some other characters in this because I need them later for something. <laughs> you know, we, we obviously have to have some kind of infection happen. So that's where the kind of the cleaning staff and, and everyone comes in. But Felicia is like one of the main staff members that I focused on um, out of all of them. She's a small character, but I wanted her to want to help. Like she see, realizes the situation they're in and she's like, oh my God, this is not what we signed up for. We're just here to cook and clean. And I had no idea this was going to go, you know, I had no idea this was going to happen. So I want to help out, um, especially after what they do to George Trevor's family. So they bring them all in. They have a big dinner. Oswald E. Spencer does not show up. And uh, turns out all their food is drugged. And so George Trevor wakes up somewhere in the mansion. And he has uh, like a, there's like a note or something for him that says, hey, so this is what we did. Uh, we drugged your wife and your daughter. And, uh, and you have to work your way through this maze because I wanna make sure all the puzzles work. I wanna make sure all the kinks are worked out and I'm using your, you and your family as lab rats. So you're gonna work your way through this mansion and all the puzzles that you helped design um, to get to your family and hopefully maybe save them in time, even though there's no chance of that because as you learn, Oswald e. Spencer is a very awful person. He injected Lisa Trevor and her mother Jessica with a version, an early version of the T-virus, uh, which was called the progenitor virus at the time, and James Marcus was working on it. So Oswald e. Spencer and James Marcus are kind of monitoring this, watching this happen along with Dr. Darius and a couple other people. Um, so 
there is like a shadow group, you know, in the in in the house, like watching them, like from the labs, like watching George Trevor move to the mansion. And he's trying to find his family. So he's trying to solve puzzles and stuff. But what happens is Lisa starts to mutate from the injection she was given. So we do see the Lisa Trevor monster in this movie, um, like the, the birthing stages of her and her growing into it. So you actually witness this horrible thing of this guy's daughter, this 14 year old girl turning into a monster. Um, and then, and you know, and kind of trying to help her dad towards the end of the story, but kind of failing at it. Some things I'm not going to spoil. Um, and then you have Jessica Trevor, um, their mom, she actually in this files in the games, they say she dies instantly from the injection. But I tweaked that a little bit. I was like, yeah, I want to do a little bit more with that. So she actually slowly turns into a zombie. I always love the file um, in the first Resident Evil game. And it's like the Keeper's Diary where he's explaining over the course of like a week, like his skin is melting off and it's like a slow, painful process of him turning into a zombie. Because if you're dead and you get, you know, and T if you get T-virus and you die uh, and you come back as a zombie, right? But if you're alive, it's slowly deteriorating you. It's breaking you down to the point where you do die and then it reanimates you. So you kind of see that transformation through Jessica uh, of what it's like to turn into a zombie. And then through Lisa, you see what it's like to turn into something more. And so because she does turn into something more, obviously Oswald E. Spencer and James Marcus were not expecting that kind of transformation. So they're like, all right, let's isolate her and let's keep an eye on George Trevor and see what he does and get through the mansion. One of the twists is, is that George Trevor didn't come up with all the puzzles uh, he is definitely a, a, a designer. Uh, he can design rooms, lay out the floor plan. He does all that stuff. But his wife actually helped him with some of the puzzles. She kind of does some of it uncredited, uh, but she's like a big puzzle freak. You know, she loves puzzles. So she helped with some of the stuff. So there are some puzzles that even he is like, oh, I remember kind of how this works. But the one thing that happens is that the stuff that George Trevor was injected with it's deteriorating his mind. It's not really a T-virus thing. It's something else, like another chemical, but it's breaking his mind down. So the longer it takes him to save his family, the more he's forgetting. Um, so that's that's the tragedy element I wanted to add to the story where you just start really feeling for this guy, where you're like, he's starting to forget even that he has to save his wife and daughter. His mind is just slowly going and the puzzles are looking stranger and stranger to the, to him. At first, he's like, all right, I remember I did this puzzle with my wife. I helped her out on this one. So he solves it and gets into the next room. And so it's it's a little bit like Saw, but it's like Resident Evil style. So because it's all the rooms and all the puzzles. And uh, and then, like I said, because of this, some of the staff who were you know isolated to the kitchen and stuff, they're packing their stuff up. They're getting ready to go. They don't know that the food was drugged and all that stuff. But the maid finds out. And so she's like, no, I, I can't. That's a little girl. You know, it's a family. I can't let them get hurt. So she involves herself. And so that is another character that um, George Trevor communicates with throughout the story so that he's not just by himself the whole time. I wanted at least another character or two for him to interact with. So that's where Felicia comes in. And then also there's a scene or two with the butler, uh, Patrick, as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I just really dive into the world of Resident Evil and the origins of it in this story it's originally set in the 60s in the video game so but i so i kept that blank i was like well do we do 60s or we do we update it to the 90s because in the video game it happens in the 60s and then the the uh, you know first video game resident evil 1 takes place in the 90s like 30 years later so to keep with that i'm like all right if we're in the 2020s now 30 years ago would have been the 1990s so i put a note in there like do we update this to the 90s or do we just keep it the 60s and just have you know but that would mess with the ages of the characters way too much and as you saw with welcome to raccoon city setting something in the 90s doesn't always work out well so i was like i'm all for modernizing it this is a, obviously a different take on res evil it's a different universe like you know you got to look at it that way i'm not making an addition to the game universe i'm making you know the first step of a new movie universe and that's kind of what this is. And so some of the monsters you see in this, um, you see uh, Jessica becomes a zombie, obviously. Lisa, you see her turn into the Lisa Trevor monster by the end. Um, the sharks do have a cameo in it, the Neptune. Um, and Yon, the snake, is slowly growing. So he's not as big as he's going to be, but it, it's growing. It's like a, a, a much bigger size snake than you're used to. And that has a cameo in it as well. Um, and I do kind of do a Resident Evil 1 movie thing, and maybe, I, and I've always thought myself on this if I was going to change it or not, but I do have um, a character in this, Dr. Darius, uh, he does, uh, he's tr he actually is like, okay, I'm not going to 
be a part of this. Um, just like the maid. and But the maid is dead at this point. Uh, she's turned into a zombie. And then she infects the other uh, staff before they leave. And so then, then you know, that's so zombies start spreading in the mansion. And then George Trevor has to deal with them as well as, uh, you know, trying to get away. Um, but that's really it. I don't have the dogs in here. They haven't started experimenting on dogs yet, at least in, in my script in this universe. Um, Plant 42 is there. And there's a, a point where you know, George Trevor makes it into the, the courtyard house and finds Plant 42. Um, it is not broken out of its constraints yet, but it's there and it's something that he interacts with. And uh, I do have one hunter. Uh, the hunters are probably one of my favorite monsters in Resident Evil and they're not in any of the films. And so I said, you know, we got to put a hunter in this. So there is a point in this where it looks like George Trevor might survive. He's trying to get to the fountain where you put the two crests in because obviously that'll bring you he thinks it just brings you to safety to escape because that's how him and his wife designed it, but it actually brings you to the lab. <laughs> so, so when he gets there, um, uh, Oswald Spencer and stuff, they're just like, yeah, let, let's release a hunter and see what that does, you know, to him. So, so there's there's an incident with a, and a battle with the hunter towards the end. Um, but at this point, George Trevor is kind of losing his mind. He still has his survival wits about him, but he's kind of forgetting what he's got to do. And there's a heartbreaking scene towards the end where. Uh, where he pretty much forgets uh, almost everything. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and then Dr. Darius, because he turns on Oswald e. Spencer and tries to do the right thing and tries to help, um, you know, George Trevor escape. He even tries to help Felicia at one point before she gets fully turned, um, but that doesn't work out so well. And he gets brought in and, and um, injected as well. And, uh, and I, my idea was that Dr. Darius was going to become the tyrant. Um, you know, they're going to inject him and they're, you know, and he starts to mutate and they notice there's something different about him too. And then you find out Oswald Spencer did this on purpose. He knew Dr. Darius's DNA was different. He knew Lisa Trevor's DNA was different. And he found ways to bring these people together in this, you know, one location at this one time so that he could have them all for future experiments. Um, so in, in hoping that it would work out, you know, he didn't know exactly what the results would be, but he had a good hope. And that's why everyone's here in this mansion. And also to tie up loose ends with George Trevor. Um, so yeah, there's, and now we do the thing where Lisa Trevor rips someone's face off uh, because, you know, she thinks it's her mother and stuff like, or, or you know, the Umbrella sends someone to dress as her mother to make him, make Lisa think it's her mother. And Lisa rips that woman's face off. So we have scenes like that that are mentioned in the, uh, the books in the game, uh, the journals. We have those scenes in this as well. Um, but yeah, like I said, and we also talk about the Ashfords. They have a cameo in it as, uh, with Edward Ashford as one of the founders of Umbrella. And then also we have a scene where uh, Dr. Alexander Ashford is talking about creating his twins, um, young Alfred and young Alexia, who become villains later on in the, um, you, know, um, you know, the Code Veronica video game. Um, but, uh, but I wanted to set that up here a little bit too. Not in the way the movie did, which I thought was really bad, how they just kind of wedged it in. This actually makes sense for the timeline, why these characters would be mentioned and introduced at this point. Um, so yeah, and it's basically like people measuring, you know, dicks in a way. <laughs> you have uh, the Ashford uh, family who are like, yeah, I created, you know, two children based off of DNA from my ancestor, Veronica Ashford, and I made Alfred and Alexia, these twins, and they're going to, you know, they're my prized uh, experiments. And then you have Oswell who's like, yeah, well, I got these DNA. It took me a while, but I found these people with these DNA strands. And now I have someone to build a tyrant from, you know, with Dr. Darius. And I have Lisa Trevor, who is an anomaly. Um, and she's actually turning out to be something way better than I thought she was going to be. And we can create a whole bunch of stuff with, with her. And then plus we have the sharks and, the, you know, and the, the snakes and all that stuff, um, the giant spiders. So, um, so a lot of those things have cameos, but the main things in it, there's a couple zombies. There's um, and the Neptune, Yawn, and Snake cameo, or, and Spider cameo. There's Plant 42 uh, moment where there's actual interaction with it and a character. And then there's the Hunter, and there's an interaction with the Hunter. So there are Resident Evil monsters in this, um, but while also keeping it single location, which is I wanted to do, which again stays true to the original Resident Evil uh, video game and Resident Evil 2, um, it's always been single location for those first two video games. And so it has that. It has the mansion, and then I also figured, well, since you're building and spending money to build the mansion for the first movie, when you make a sequel and you base it off the first video game, um, you can reuse the set. So I was like trying to think, like uh, you know, production-wise too, of trying to do it smart. But one last thing I want to mention: if you don't know the origins of Res Evil, the video game, originally there were more files from George Trevor. 
Uh, there was a, an idea they had uh, that Shinji Mikami and other people that made the first Resident Evil game, they had this idea where throughout the mansion there would be little notes. So you would actually see how far through the mansion that George Trevor got. Uh, so that it was telling his backstory. In the final product, they cut a lot of that out and they just restricted it to like two or three little journals entries uh, where you can learn about him. And then in the remake, they add the Lisa stuff. So it expanded on that, but you you believe that he got as far as the room with the his own headstone in it. There's a point in the story where George Trevor ends up in a room, he falls through a hole in the floor and he ends up in this room where that he sees his tombstone. And he's like, oh, that's it, I'm gonna die here. And it's kind of led to believe that he did die in that room. But originally, the original concept, and I gotta thank crimsonhead.com, uh, who has a lot of this information out there, and I'll put that link to their channel, or to their website down below. Um, but they have really good posts about the Trevor family. A lot of, lot of research, a lot of good work. Um, but there was originally an idea where George Trevor got past that tombstone. He found the switch, the tombstone moved, just like uh, Chris and Jill do in the video game. And he goes down into the basement and finds a you know a way out of the mansion into the courtyard house and all that stuff through the kitchen and all that um so that's i put that in the story i said you know what let's have him get past that room let's make that the room where fans will go okay this is where he dies he's gonna die like 40 minutes into the movie and then he finds the switch and you're like oh what the you know because originally like i said in res evil you'd go to the courtyard house you'd go to all these places the caves underground and you would find these like you know scribbles in the wall from George Trevor telling you he made it this far and that he found the cranks and that you need to use different cranks to turn the the wheels and stuff so he kind of was there guiding you like uh you know solving the puzzles and guiding you but he does get to a point where he dies because he like I said he wants to in the original version of Resident Evil he wanted the two crests the wolf crest and the eagle crest he needed those to get to the um to the fountain and open up the secret passageway that he thought led to freedom because that's how him and his wife designed the place. But really it just lowers him into the laboratory where there's more monsters and bull crap that he has to deal with. There is a, a, a helicopter pad nearby, but you have to go through the laboratory to get to the helicopter pad. So he thinks he made it to freedom and that's what we have. There's a point like an hour into this story, like 60, 70 pages into the script where he's like, I made it. And he, then the elevator takes him down and he's like, wait, what's happening? Where am I going? And then he sees the lab and he's like, you know, he falls to his knees. And at this point, his mind is going, he's starting to have nosebleeds and um, he's starting to forget why he's there in the first place. Um, so, yeah, I, anyway, so that's that's my version of Resident Evil. It's called Domicile. It was a script, like I said, I wrote a couple years ago and then refined over, the, you know, a little bit here and there. I haven't touched it probably in about a year now, um, but because obviously I'm working on other stuff, but it's uh, still a spec script I have. I keep it around in case um, there's ever a chance someone asks me, hey, you know, your your TV show thing you were going to work on never happened. Do you have other horror scripts you want to send us? Because uh, I can't send that script really to anyone to read because it's owned by, you know, somebody. Um, but at least domicile, I can. So I can say, well, I can send you the script that, you know, kind of got more people believing in me, <laughs> you know, to be on this project. Because when I was on that TV show project, I was a nobody to a lot of those people. They're like, dude, we don't know you you were recommended. I don't, you know, I'm not sure we should use you, but, you know, impress us. So it was like, okay. So luckily I did. Um, but yeah, Domicile I'm very proud of. I love Resident Evil so much. And I feel like this would be a great start to the Resident Evil franchise. I know a lot of people would be like, no, you got to start with Chris. You got to start with Jill. But the thing is we've tried all that, you know, like they've tried that. They didn't at this point when I wrote Domicile, Welcome to Raccoon City wasn't even in production. Um, it was, you know, this was a couple years ago before COVID. So it was not, it was, it might not have happened, you know, so, but I still took a chance and said, no, these are characters from the game. They may not be Chris and Jill and all that, but this will set all that up uh, because we mentioned Project W in this, like we literally set everything for you to build a franchise off of, but it's not just a setup movie. There's a real story to it too. Like, and, and I thought a scary one because the idea of being in a house that you helped design and then slowly losing your mind uh, and the goal is, you, hey, if you solve the puzzles, you can escape with your family, which is a lie goal, but it's still, it breaks your heart because you, know, you don't find out it's a lie till towards the end. And it's, it's you just watch George Trevor deteriorating, you know, watching, um, you know, or, uh, you know, watching his mind go or feeling his mind go every time he gets into a room and he's like, I know this, I know this. And he's like, 
you know, punching the wall. Like, you know, he's getting frustrated. He's like, no, I know how to do this. Like, you know, um, what is it? Like, my, and he's like, oh, I, you know, my wife did this one, you know, and I, I don't really remember how the stained glass works and, you know, all this stuff or how, how the paintings work. And so some of the puzzles I did original RE1 puzzles because I figured when you do the sequel and you, you know, do the Resident Evil 1 movie, um, you could update them to the remake puzzles because you could you could say Oswald Spencer was like yeah we tried those versions like uh, and they they you know he solved them too easily so uh, so we upgraded them from the paintings uh, of from birth to death we changed that to the stained glass you know um, so yeah anyway uh, that's uh, that's what I have uh, and there's also a crimson head uh, that's why I mentioned the website too one of the uh, characters does become uh, a crimson head uh, so yeah anyway that's that's the story of domicile without hopefully too many spoilers but i wanted to make this nice and long because trusty rusty was very excited to uh, hear about this idea so hopefully some of you out there got a little kick out of this too of just me talking about this script that i have sitting you know in a drawer basically um waiting to be used one day but i want to try to finish the stuff i'm working on now before i pursue any more writing assignments and stuff because i'm obviously very behind on everything i'm working on and i'm struggling with it on some levels and so i want to get through these obstacles before I really take on anything else. Um, so maybe Domicile will live one day and hopefully I didn't ruin too much of it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Trusty Rusty, I appreciate uh, you asking about this. That was really cool. And I hope this, you know, scratch that itch for you. Uh, itchy tasty. I hope this scratch that itch for you. And uh, I know this isn't the script that you wanted to read, but hopefully this is a good consolation for you and anyone else out, th out there who enjoyed it. And if you're a Res Evil fan, Tell me some of your favorite Resident Evil stuff down below. If you're a fan who writes as well and creates and directs, let me know what you would do with the Resident Evil franchise down below, and we can definitely keep talking about that down in the comments. Thanks so much for watching the show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and happy Halloween 2022. Thanks so much. Peace.